is a land of extremes. Whenever a pandemic strikes, people tend to rocket off in one of two distinct directions. A fear of an existential crisis or the other that drives them into a self-centered or narrow-minded panic or a drive towards mutual aid and doing all they can to help their neighbors in society. One of these is more reflective of the society we currently live in and the other forms the building blocks towards a more ideal future. The coronavirus pandemic is bringing to light the ugly and oft ignored flaws of the society we live in and with millions now beginning a weeks-long quarantine, it felt like an appropriate time to examine the roots of panic, fear, anti-intellectualism, and xenophobia that all arise in times of crises, and why they're all intertwined with an even greater looming threat. The groaning husk of late-stage capitalism that now threatens to bury us all as it collapses under the strain of our completely broken economic and healthcare system. And to begin, let's look at something that we've all liked likely experienced over the past few weeks. It's a bizarre sight, truly. When you're in the midst of an outbreak of a new respiratory virus, it's perplexing to walk into a supermarket and notice that the aisles selling toilet paper, face masks, and hand sanitizer are completely barren, while the vitamins, body wash, certain bulk foods all look pristine and untouched. As if the logic centers in millions of people's brains all suddenly disconnected at once and they were driven into an absolute frenzy. For me, at least, I don't understand the connection between toilet paper and coronavirus unless people are shitting themselves in fear. So what's behind this seemingly nonsensical behavior? Brian Lufkin in an interview for the BBC said, experts say the answer lies in a fear of the unknown and believing that a dramatic event warrants a dramatic response, even though in this case the best response is something as mundane as washing your hands. The coronavirus pandemic is something we have never experienced before, or at least since the 1918 flu pandemic, and the combination of A, constant misinformation about the virus on social media, and B, the federal and state governments taking strong action like shutting down schools, libraries, restaurants, gatherings of more than 10 people as per new White House guidelines, and in some cases locking entire countries down as the EU has just done. Ken Jorgensen, in an article for the Modern Survival blog said, one general observation I've noticed is that when there are a group of people who are all in a given emergency situation, if there's someone in the group in a vocal panic, the situation is often worsened due to some of the others who will start going off the edge while the person in a panic is spouting all of the wrong things. There's something about mass panic that awakens a more primal part of our psyche and causes us to revert back to something that our common ancestors all engaged in, herd behavior, or the behavior of individuals in a group acting collectively without centralized direction. This was the driving force behind how they lived, and even though we humans are now hundreds of thousands of years removed from those times, there are still traces of that behavior intact within us, which come out in a big way when crises like this arise. Closely related to herd behavior is another concept which I'm sure we're all a little bit more familiar with, mob mentality, or unique behavior that arises when a large group of people are together, which can become increasingly dangerous as the size of the group increases. Megan Donnelly, in an article for South Source, said, typically the bigger a mob, the more its members will lose their self-awareness and become willing to engage in dangerous behavior, and that the greater the individuals feel they identify with the group, the greater the pressure becomes for them to conform and de-individualize or lose their own sense of self and individuality. With the news of an impending mass outbreak in America, people everywhere have begun to act in unison, buying mass amounts of non-essential items because they saw others doing it on social media and the news, and creating a butterfly effect that ripples out into society causing a snowball of increasingly panicked behavior. The people engaging in this behavior might not even understand why they're doing so, but the instinctual urge to follow a crowd is something that we have all experienced on both smaller and larger scales. Self-preservation is an evolutionary behavior that we all possess, but common sense isn't, unfortunately. <laughs> Humans can often do more harm than good to themselves and others, 
especially when outside sources are playing a role in that behavior. The CDC is currently urging everyone to practice social distancing or staying at least three feet away from others in public, keeping away from those who are immunocompromised and or elderly so as not to spread the disease to them if you're already carrying it, and self-isolating or keeping yourself at home unless you absolutely need to go out for necessities like medicine and groceries, but even then using caution if you need to do so. They've made it clear why it's critical that everyone do this now in order to slow the spread of coronavirus. So why is it that millions of Americans are choosing to defy these orders and continue to go out to public. Videos have been released from Florida, Nashville, and Los Angeles that show thousands upon thousands of people still going out to the beach, attending concerts, hanging out at bars in large numbers, and acting as if there isn't a serious pandemic working its way through the population as we speak. Again, there's no self-awareness of the fact that they could all be infecting one another because you can be asymptomatic for up to two weeks, and they could be spreading it from there once they're home. It doesn't help that conservatives in government and media are outright ignoring the CDC's warnings with Trump saying, oh, it's not a big deal and it's just like the flu. Um, both are which astounding and dangerous claims to make, especially for someone of his position. And Fox News regulars like Trish Regan claiming that this is nothing more than a hoax created by the Democrat Party to take down Trump. Can we all can we all just sit back and uh, think about that for a second? Really? Possible alt-writer Devin Nunez, during an interview with Maria Bartiromo, encouraged people to keep going out if they're healthy, and the infamous Sheriff David A. Clark, who definitely doesn't sound like he's foaming at the mouth in a rage-fueled frenzy 24-7, went on a Twitter tirade saying, in mostly all caps, Go into the streets, folks, visit bars, restaurants, shopping malls, churches, and demand that your schools reopen. Now! If government doesn't stop this foolishness, stay in the streets, in government control over our lives. If not now, when? This is an exploitation of a crisis. And Rodney Howard Brown, leader of Revival Ministries International, said during a sermon in Tampa Bay that he refused to close his church. He said, this Bible school is open because we're raising up revivalists and not pansies, and even encouraged his congregation to shake hands, saying, the only time this church will ever close is when the rapture is taking place. Once again, reaffirming that evangelicals are nothing more than a death cult. Ironically enough, though, Pastor Brown was sent to the White House to pray with Trump, but Trump, on the same day as Brown's sermon, put up a tweet discouraging people from shaking hands. That's funny. And during one of his sermons, Kenneth Copeland, a televangelist from my home state of Texas, used the power of prayer to heal people of coronavirus. Although, why are his hands wet on here? Hashtag corona. And Christians on Twitter have been writing utterly bonkers things like, there is no coronavirus. It's all fake news to force a massive worldwide quarantine eventually because Satan loves to divide and conquer and isolate us because there is greater strength in numbers. Stay connected to others. Don't isolate yourself. Anyone with two brain cells and a smidge of common sense would recognize the ridiculousness of this. Atheists like myself understand that evangelicals often see the world through a supernatural lens and believe that viruses, plagues, storms, and disasters are the wrath of God. And the only thing that can save us is believing a sky daddy that none of us have ever seen in person, but they are utterly convinced exists. They're completely disconnected from science, and they willingly tout ignorance as if it were a strength, but they do untold amounts of damage in the process, and people still fall in line, engage in herd behavior, and treat misinformation as fact while throwing actual facts completely out the window. Where does this willingness to disregard the truth and think only of one's self come from? There's an oft-repeated pattern within American culture in which people never seem to care about the wider population until something bad happens to them directly. Conservative and religious ideologies tend to paint reality as an ongoing struggle of us versus them 
and that those who criticize their beliefs, even if those who are criticizing are actually right, are the enemy and are trying to corrupt them. The tendency of these people to dig their heels in and bury their heads in the sand and become even more confident about their beliefs is known as the backfire effect, which is one manifestation of confirmation bias, or the tendency to be more open to information that lines up with your own beliefs, rather than willingly accept that they're misinformed and or wrong and opening themselves up to new perspectives. So when voices outside their bubble talk about needing to take precautions and change their behavior, their response is not logical, but reactionary. And much like fascists tend to do, they will cling to the image of a leader, deity, or the words of like-minded people and or media figures, they will fall into groupthink or the uncritical acceptance of a perceived majority view, and they will all fight back. Conservatism, evangelism, and far-right ideologies all pride themselves on groupthink, and they tend to push back against critical thinking. But with America in general, I do think there is another thing that's fueling this behavior that we're seeing. In my opinion, capitalism and the basic empathy and understanding of others can never coexist. And a comment from Reddit beautifully sums up what I think is the root of the fuck you got mine mentality. It goes, I think our capitalist society based entirely on competition breeds sociopathy. We are trained from a young age to want to be better than others, to do whatever we can to get ahead, and to think of ourselves as unique individuals responsible for everything that happens in our life. All of those things are fundamentally opposed to empathy, and a lack of empathy is the main characteristic of sociopathy. Until our society starts training people to work together rather than try to pull each other down to get ahead, we're all just a bunch of angry crabs in a bucket. And when something happens that inconveniences them, they react with anger or refuse to ridicule the perceived inconvenience. At work a few days ago, I told a guest that we would have to pour creamer and sugar for them in order to minimize the risk of a guest passing COVID onto us. They first said, don't y'all think you're going overboard with this? And I said, well, we're just doing what we can to take everyone. And the guest fired back with, well, I have a life to live too. When you're told to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, seeking help from others is seen as a sign of weakness. And you believe that it's virtuous to figure your own battles out under whatever circumstance necessary. Capitalism and American exceptionalism together cause the individual to feel as if they hold more value than others because of their place in society and the world. And therefore they have the right to ignore the suffering of others when the others are those they were taught to look down upon. Privilege truly is a dehumanizing monster. And the issue is that millions upon millions are raised to think this way, which causes tremendous conflict when they're all thrown into the lion's den that is the American economy, and they're all told to do whatever it takes to get to the top. The free market at work, comrades. The only ones actually benefiting from this bloodletting are those who actually hold the vast majority of wealth in America. Almost like they've been tricked into participating in a system that is slowly eating away at them, all while the wealthy sit back and watch, fat, and happy. Those who have fallen for toxic individualism have lost sight of the fact that they are all part of a much larger worldwide community and that we are all forever tied together, affected by others' actions and affecting others with the actions that we take. We're all connected and to believe that you yourself are separate from the suffering of others is to blind yourself to the possibility that in a split second you could be in their place. As lockdowns continue across America, we now more than ever need to see ourselves as one united community and form a network of support that ensures that everyone receives mutual aid. Take for example Vietnam, which has been a communist country since 1945. According to a video by American Johnson of non-compete and his wife Luna, which I will link in the description and above, Vietnam was the first country to successfully contain the SARS virus and COVID-19, has developed vaccines, treatment, 
and containment protocols that they will happily share with the world. Even more noteworthy is that they developed a quick test which has 100% accuracy in one month. The World Health Organization said the development of this test kit should have taken four years. They are now producing 10,000 of them a day. Free food, treatment, and living supplies are given to highly affected neighborhoods. Mobile sterilization chambers have been built to cleanse residents of any virus particles that could be clinging to their bodies. Any lost wages are being covered. And all of this is being done because of mutual aid. Now, there is a reason I keep saying that. You'll uh, find out why in a second. However, the communal-minded culture of Vietnam is currently coming into conflict with the more individual-centric cultures to varying degrees of America and European countries due to white tourists refusing to wear face masks while traveling through Vietnam even though they're being given out for free. Luna posted a Twitter thread in which these tourists were asked why they refused to do so. Responses ranged from, well, the mask makes me feel uncomfortable. It only stops the virus from people who already carry the virus. But I'm pretty sure that I'm not carrying the virus. <laughs> pretty sure. That's always reassuring. And I think it's not necessary, so I don't wear it. We are white Europeans. Maybe that's why the Vietnamese think that we carry the virus. You could be carrying it right now! It sounds like she's implying that her skin color is the reason that she isn't sick. But again, there's this refusal to respect foreign cultures or the well-being of others, and they act surprised or amused when others point out how problematic just that one decision of not wearing a face mask could be. Where this disrespect of non-Americans is turning truly ugly, though, is the re-emergence of toxic xenophobia against those of Asian descent for no other reason than that the coronavirus originated in China. Ever since the 1870s, the days of Chinese migrants being abused and forced to build the railroads, deeply rooted white supremacy and white privilege have been weaponized against every generation that came after. Xenophobic fears led to an intense restriction of Chinese migrants during the 1920s to prevent any threats to the white Anglo-Saxon population, or WASP. And these fears continued during the Cold War in days of McCarthyism, or making accusations of treason with no evidence whatsoever to back those claims up. Those of other ethnic origins have been seen as dirty, and we're currently seeing a steep drop especially from my perspective here in Portland, of business for Chinese restaurants, an avoidance of those who look of Asian descent in public and on public transit, and even Trump himself has been glibly tweeting about people being affected by the Chinese virus, as if all Chinese people are carrying COVID. Trump, we see what you're doing. Come on. Nadia Alam, a doctor from Georgetown, Ontario, said during an interview with Time Magazine that we saw this during the Ebola and SARS outbreaks. And I did, however, think that we had learned from the past. It's 2020. And Monica Shock Spana, a senior scholar at John Hopkins, also said, Unfortunately, social stigma, blame, and discrimination are recurrent phenomena during outbreaks over history. And it's really tied up in the fact that people often need to fix blame during an outbreak of a contagious disease. Shotspana went on into detail about a more positive trend of human behavior in which people band together and defend one another in times of disaster. She said, if you look across outbreaks over history, you have people really rising to the occasion. During past outbreaks, for example, like the influenza pandemic of 1918, people stepped up to volunteer to transport the ill to local hospitals or deliver food to sick families. There's also actually a more frequent impulse to stand together in a community to deal with a potential infectious disease. Social media has utterly transformed the planet and helped us all see past old stereotypes and mindsets and begun to awaken more and more class consciousness and how critical it is to see ourselves as a global community 
that needs to work together in order to ensure our survival. There's a writer and well-known philosopher who believed that society should be based around the idea of people coming together, supporting one another, and making sure that everyone's well-being is taken care of. And that writer is anarchist and revolutionary Peter Kropotkin. His essay, Mutual Aid, is especially relevant now as we wait out the storm of COVID-19. In it, he states, In the long run, the practice of solidarity proves much more advantageous to the species than the development of individuals who are endowed with predatory inclinations. Capitalism is by its very nature predatory and thus contradictory to humanity's innate drive towards being part of a larger community. We all deep down desire to be part of something bigger, to feel valued and appreciated, to feel that there's a circle of others around us who will be there for us, to be artists and storytellers, and to give a little piece of ourselves to everyone around us. The only time capitalists will actually care about art or innovation is if they can make money off of it. Hello, Elon Musk. And they'll seek to commodify and separate those things from us, stripping them of heart and preventing the laborer from ever receiving the full value of their labor. Kropotkin continues by saying, the species in which peace and mutual support are the rule will prosper, while the unsociable species decay, and practicing mutual aid is the surest means for giving each other and to all the greatest safety, the best guarantee of existence and progress, bodily, intellectual, and moral. In a time of crisis, mutual aid and solidarity among every single member of society are what will make us more resilient, closer as a people, and more understanding of the struggles that we have not yet experienced. And across the world, as we sit on the verge of complete shutdown, this is being put into action and showing the true potential of a modern anarchist society, which I would love to see happen worldwide, even if that is a ways off. Petitions and movements for things like rent, mortgage, and eviction freezes, emergency sick pay, Medicare for all, free testing, neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor support, distribution of supplies and groceries, transporting vulnerable members of the community, free food for school closures, and more, have exploded like wildfire. And what we're now seeing, perhaps more than ever, are the seeds of a true global proletariat revolution. Could this bring about the shirking off of materialism, the end of toxic individuality and harmful mom mentalities, the decision to no longer consume misinformation or ignore the suffering of others, the opening up of one's eyes to learning about and understanding those who live and think differently than you, the end of xenophobia and other forms of harmful institutionalized discrimination, and the realization that we should all share the same power in society? Perhaps. But one thing does still stand in our way. The hierarchies that have been built by the powerful and wealthy might be imposing, but we outnumber them and we can topple them. What exactly are those hierarchies and what exactly should we do to go about bringing them down? Well, you're gonna have to wait till next Friday to find out. And that is gonna be it for this week's video. If y'all enjoyed, be sure to give it a like if you wanna see more content from me. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you will be notified for all of my future videos. I release a video every single Friday and will be doing so from here on out. If we're all gonna be quarantined during the COVID outbreak, it means more time for writing and shooting, so I can't really complain too much. But until then, be safe. Wash your damn hands, stay inside if you don't have to go out, take care of each other, and just don't panic. We're gonna make it through this. It's gonna be hard, but I promise we are going to survive this. I love y'all, stay safe, I'll see you soon.